This Week in Startups is brought to you by Asana. Asana gives teams everything they need to manage projects, tasks, and work productively to deliver better results faster. Visit asana.com slash twist to sign up for free. And Athletic Greens, the most complete supplement for a better you. Receive 20 free travel packs valued at $99 with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. I am an angel investor here in Silicon Valley and an entrepreneur, journalist, and podcaster, author of Angel the Book, which you can go buy uh, or listen to if you happen to like the sound of my voice. There's three or four of you who do. And today I'm going to do an Ask Jason. This is where I answer questions from founders and from other investors about startups and how to invest in them, and how to grow them. And the first question is from Gary. He asks, who has surprised you the most as a founder? Anyone you thought wasn't good enough who turned out to be great? Now, I thought about this, and the first name that came to my mind was I was at the TED conference. I didn't go to TED, but I was at a dinner back when I was at Monterey, and they introduced me to this kid, Zuckerberg. And I was sitting there having dinner, and it was me, Larry Page, Evan Williams from Blogger, and then... He went on to Twitter, of course, and this kid Zuckerberg, and he had, Sean Parker had brought him to this dinner, and he had just done this Facebook thing, and I was completely underwhelmed by him. He was very quiet. He didn't ask any questions. He didn't talk, and I was completely, completely surprised when I saw how effective he was at building the world's uh, largest social network, and candidly, one of the the most... um, humanity changing projects in the world. Now, additionally, and I know people think I'm hard on Zuckerberg, but I was also kind of thought he was a little bit strange in like how he interacted with us. And I thought this person is going to create a social network. That was also like what I underestimated. And I think what I underestimated was he just had a singular focus on growth. And we see what that did for Facebook. If you look at their greatest innovation. It was the ability to copy other people's ideas and do them better and take out friction. So I don't think that Zuckerberg doesn't have any ideas. I don't think he had many ideas, except let me take Friendster, let me take other innovations like groups or photos and remove friction. And the removing of friction is a great lesson for any founder. So while I underestimated him, I now appreciate, and I'm terrified of, the removal of friction from products. And I'll give you a couple of examples. And it's a very important thing for founders to understand why this is powerful. If people have friction, then they drop off in the funnel of usage of your product. So an example of that is when they launched groups, they gave you the ability to start a group and add people to it. Now, before that, there were e-groups, there were Google groups, but nothing has taken off like Facebook groups. And the reason is when you're on a Facebook group, you can add people to the group without their permission. And they are now members of that group. And the other members of the group can add other people without permission. This seemed crazy to all of us in Silicon Valley. Oh my God, how, are you, how do you let people do that? Also, how do you let an app company download my friend list and their interest without getting their permission? And this is, of course, what Cambridge Analytica did and what resulted in this huge investigation that's gone on now. We can talk about the responsibility for all this, but I think the responsibility lies in Zuckerberg's key strength as a founder, which is his maniacal focus on removing friction. You can see it in other businesses as well. So another business that has removed friction is Uber. When you got in an Uber, You didn't need to tell the driver your name because your name was in the app. And he didn't or she didn't need to tell you their name because it's in the app. You didn't need to take your credit card out or cash and pay them, wait for change and do a tip because they took tipping out. They've since edited it back as an option, which I agree with. Um, But it's kind of a polarizing issue, I know. But you didn't have to take your credit card out. So just those two things alone, the fact that we know each other's name and I don't have to go through the whole payment process, that took out you know, a couple of minutes for every ride, which adds up and it makes things go faster. The same thing with putting the destination in. People don't remember this, but you used to have to explain to your driver where you were going. If you get in a taxi, the cab driver turns around, throws their arm over the 
head rest and says, hey, where you going, Mac? And you have to explain to him, ah, I'm going to the Museum of Natural History. It's up over here, and here's how I want you to get there. That doesn't happen anymore, right, because of the removal of friction. So, Gary, great question. I took it on a bit of a tangent, but I certainly underestimated how the uncreative copying nature of Zuckerberg, his Borg-like ability to steal other ideas, and you saw him steal Snapchat's ideas, right, wholesale, and if he took Snapchat's ideas and he put them in Facebook and other products, that's what he does well. He's like the Borg. He takes other people's properties, absorbs them, and makes them faster and more fluid. You need to understand that kind of behavior, both to be inspired by it, but also to be cautious. Because if you go too fast, you can take things off the rails. And we're seeing that right now. We don't know what kind of regulation will happen, if Zuckerberg's going to get away with it or not. But it, there could be some consequences for going that fast. Of course, he made $50 billion. So what's the consequence if you've already taken down $50 billion? All right. Great question, Gary. Okay. Our next question comes from Toby. Thoughts on how to effectively use crowdsourcing to solve real world problems? Great question, Toby. I love this question. Crowdsourcing, uh, everybody knows by this point, is the innovation that we saw really at Wikipedia first. That was the first real crowdsourcing effort, which was... Let's make an encyclopedia page. Anybody can edit it. And the changes will trend towards the truth. Now, if you have a profile page or a bio page on Twitter and it's a bio of a living person, you know that about 30% is incorrect and done by the people who don't like you. But putting that aside, that was the first real crowdsourcing uh, that we saw on the internet. And it works really well. Crowdsourcing to solve real world problems can come in a couple of different forms. One is to collect money. The other is to collect ideas, and the other is to mobilize people to take action, right? So there's a couple of different flavors of this. Obviously, raising money, Kickstarter, Patreon, this gives people the fuel they need to create sustainable projects. And I think those, that alone is just this wonderful exercise because by forcing the creator of the project to make a refined pitch, just making that video where they look into the video and say, I would like to see this exist in the world. Would you like to participate in that? If you would, please enter your credit card number. This made people more focused on solving more and more important problems. So this is an incredible innovation by Kickstarter. Indiegogo actually was out before them, so they should actually get more credit for it. And many hands make for light work. So we see this also with angel investing. We crowdsource and get a syndicate of angels to invest in a company. 100 people putting in $3,000, you know, equals $300,000. And that could be enough to get a company going for six months or 12 months. If it's just a small team spending 25K a month, they might change the world. So raising money, obviously, uh, and building something and then ideas. There, are, there have been some idea marketplaces, Toby, but those haven't worked because ideas are a dime a dozen. What really is required is effort. And to have sustained effort, you need money. So... If you want to solve a real world problem, crowdsourcing a product or a service, getting those early supporters on who will deal with a product or a service being rough around the edges, let's say, late on delivery, underwhelming when it gets delivered, but charming because it doesn't yet exist in the world, that's where crowdsourcing um, really helps. And people don't do it enough. I mean, I've seen people... Uh, do things like crowdsource private security for their neighborhoods. And I think that you're going to see more of that in the future where people say, hey, government isn't doing a good job in this area. What if we all chipped in? And Patreon was really a great example of this where I would like to see somebody play violin every day in the park. We could all just contribute a dollar. And if we get to, you know, three or $4,000 a month, there would be an incredible violin player at sunset every day in a park. That would be an amazing thing to happen, right? Why hasn't that happened? Well, it has. On Patreon, you see people getting small donations, a dollar, two dollars, and it adds up. And we need to see more of this actually in society because small amounts of money, we see it through taxes, can go have huge impact on society. So I'm a huge fan of it. The way you have to do it is really craft a great message and find those early true supporters who will amplify your thoughts on it. And there are consultants who are really good at this. So if you type in crowdsourcing consultant or Kickstarter or Indiegogo consultant, there are literally PR firms and consulting firms that will help you make the videos, help you do the PR campaign, and actually help you find the influencers, bloggers, tweeters, Instagrammers, YouTubers, who might amplify your message. So 
depending, you don't specify exactly what you're looking to solve in the real world, depending on what you're trying to solve for making a movie, making art, you know, having more security in your neighborhood. There's a lot of different platforms to do that. Great question, Toby. I am so happy to read this ad for Asana because I love Asana. I am using Asana all day long. Why? Because I'm trying to get a lot done in my life and I've got a team, an amazing team. Emmy award winning producer Jackie's on the team. I got Jason DeMont running the Launch Incubator. We've got a huge team of great people, but I need to know what everybody's doing and I need to know when their work is due and I need to know where to find information and we have all these routine tasks that we do over and over again. Okay, we're doing another incubator class. Okay, we're doing Founder University. Okay, we're doing the next launch festival in Sydney. And this is where Asana comes in for us. We keep everything super organized. It's the easiest way to manage your team's projects and tasks. And I am telling you this because not only am I using it at the office, I'm using it at my home office. So everything we're trying to get done at home, my wife and I, we're just getting everything super organized. Hey, we gotta get this done, we gotta get that done. Tesla chargers, we moved into a new house, maybe we need to get curtains. Everything is tracked and perfect. So I feel like my life is finally, finally under control thanks to Asana. I couldn't be happier with this product. And your teammates can see plans and they don't miss their milestones and deadlines because there's better communication. There's transparency. This is super important. And teams can create repeatable processes. This is like the Checklist Manifesto, a great book that I read back in the day because I heard that Jack from Twitter read that book. It was one of his favorite books. Checklist Manifesto, it shows that if people are like doing repetitive tests, like flying an airplane, if they go through a checklist, the plane doesn't crash. Well, listen, yours is not as dire as that, but your checklist is going to make sure you don't make mistakes and that you have more consistency in your company. So those repeatable tasks, doing checklists that you can do with Asana is critical. Also, you can view your stuff as a list. You can view it as a Kanban board. However you want to look at it, even a calendar, timeline. You can do all that fancy, dancy stuff. But the truth is, 30,000 companies are, are doing this right now in 192 countries. They trust Asana. People like Airbnb, Uber, Thumbtack, and Facebook. And I'm an investor in two of those four companies. Uh, and you can integrate with hundreds of apps like Google, Dropbox, and Slack. And we actually have it connected to a couple of those services. So go ahead and start using Asana for free today. Asana.com slash twist. Asana is spelled A-S-A-N-A. 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 Asana.com slash twist. You will love this product. Even if you're a company of just one or two people, Start using it and get ready for your growth. Have everything organized. And what happens is the next team member comes on board and they see everything nice and organized. They go, oh, wow, this is a great company to work for. We love Asana here. I love Asana personally. I have it on my mobile phone. I get alerts. I get these email. Hey, these are the tasks. And it's one of the great things. Now I walk through the office. I'm like, put that on my Asana to-do list. Put that on her Asana to-do list. Put it on their Asana to-do list. And we are getting super effective. I love it. I love being efficient. I love getting stuff done. GSD. And Asana helps me get stuff done. It's really just a great product. I cannot tell you how life-changing this product is. I am so enthusiastic about it. Go try asana.com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. Okay, here we go. Here's a question from Sam. Jason, what's your latest view on AI and the industries you see this transforming the most in the next 12 to 18 months? So in the short term, uh, how much do you as seeing as being hype versus real? And what are you most bullish about here? Okay. So anytime a new technology comes out, people slap it onto the back of their startup name. Okay, we're doing Netflix with AI. Oh, yeah, we're doing Google with AI. And, you know, real AI um, and generalized AI, this is going to be a decade-long process. What really is happening is a lot of machine learning right now where machines are learning and there are decision trees. So when you think about stuff like that, one of the things that's going to work really well is customer support. So you call customer support and already there's a decision tree, right? Press one if your VCR is flashing 12. Press two if your VCR won't turn on. These kind of um, techniques are going to work really well because you could say, hey, my oven's not working. And the AI will start asking you questions. The next time somebody calls in, it'll start figuring out patterns. And it may be patterns that we're not aware of. It might be that people in one part of the country are having problems with their ovens because there's salt and corrosion and we don't have them on the West Coast, but on the East Coast we have that, right? So there are all of these factors, all of this data being studied. Oh, it turns out people 
you know, who are young are having this problem, but old people aren't having it. People who are a certain height or a certain weight are reacting a certain way to a certain drug or a certain diet that's being um, suggested by a dietitian. There's all this big data sitting out there that we're collecting right now on social networks and Google search engine and, and their data that they collect on our phones and on our Fitbits. So we don't actually know how the decision will be made and what data will do it. But in customer support, we're going to see it in drugs and we're going to see it in uh, medicine, I think, in, in a lot of places like that. But you asked specifically about the short term. And I think a lot about customer support and solving problems. And I think that's going to be one of them. Education as well, being able to know where somebody is going to have problems and how to best train the algorithm and train the AI to, AI to teach them. Well, if the AI can learn to beat us at poker or beat us at Go or beat us at chess, it can also teach us how to be better at these things and do what's called adaptive learning, where if you're really good at maybe division and subtraction, but you're not good at multiplication, it's going to figure that out very quickly and make an intervention to teach you how to catch up. So AI combined with uh, DNA and changing people's IQs, <laughs> we could see a, a lot of the world change very quickly. So AI is very interesting to me, um, but I think it's still pretty far off, I'll be honest. Um, I haven't seen many examples where today businesses are being transformed radically by it, except perhaps with Google and search. You're, I think there's a lot of AI going uh, on back there, and obviously there's a ton of machine learning. Okay, great question. Uh, Danilo asks... Why are there so little number of startups in the video game industry? Seems to be a very fast-growing market, but not so many solutions to help small or medium game studios to make money. It's a great question. The reason why we don't invest in the venture community and angel investors in video games is because it's a hit-based business. There's no way for us to know that this company is going to hit that very, very slim chance of creating Call of Duty or, uh, you know, whatever, Grand Theft Auto. And these hits are the majority of the revenue. So it's very much like the movie business where it takes a lot of taste and you have to have a certain uh, gut for it. It doesn't really exist in the venture community, nor does the outsized returns. So while, of course, you know, if you happen to bet on the Avengers or Star Wars in the early days, you would have been rewarded. Most people in the venture community would rather look at data and pick uh, businesses based on the team, what they've built and the early traction. And let's face it, with games, there is no early traction. You release the game, and then you find out if you've got a hit or not. And it's very hard to have a scientific approach to that. It's very hard to have an investment thesis to that. It has happened. You do see people investing in things like Quiz Up and you know other games. Um, but it's very few and far between. And the people who have bet on them have bet on studio-like companies that have a collection of games. So to the extent you could say, I'm doing Zynga and we're going to do games that are all social in nature. And if you like Farmville, you're going to like Mafia Boss or whatever. And maybe we can save, you know, a little bit of money because you'll move from game to game, possibly, but not probably uh, in terms of investment strategy. So that's why we don't do it. And... There is a solution for game studios to make money. I mean, they have the greatest crowdfunding ever. People are investing well ahead of time, you know, $100 million, $10 million, $50 million. They'll pay in advance for the game a year or two in advance um, to, to see it uh, come to fruition. So I really think they don't actually, the great video game producers don't need venture capital. They don't want to have boards. They just want to build something great with their super fans. So great question. That's why investors don't get involved in video games. Coleco asks in our chat room, am I actively investing in cannabis startups? And we've done one investment in Kush Marketplace. It is not a grower of cannabis. It is not a processor of cannabis. It is not a dispensary of cannabis, nor is it a delivery service of cannabis, nor is it a branded cannabis offering like different gummies or tinctures or brands. No, it's none of those things. It's the marketplace in which those people trade. So Kush doesn't touch the product, but growers will put their cannabis on the Kush marketplace 
and processors, which are another group of individuals in the, in the legal cannabis space, I should always say that, they will uh, process the flowers, as they're called. I'm getting an education on this. Then there are um, people who make products, right? Like, so branded products. They will buy from the processors or from the growers. Then there are people who are distributors, and then those distributors sell to dispensaries, and sometimes dispensaries buy directly from the producers. Sometimes they buy directly from the farms. Anyway, there's a lot of commerce going on here. It's a multi-sided marketplace, so you might have, you know, a, a you know a, a grower who also does the processing, who also makes a tincture and has a brand, but doesn't have a dispensary. So, long story short, I believe we will have a national referendum on cannabis. Uh, in our lifetime, in the next two or three presidencies. So after Trump's third or fourth term, depending on how many he goes, whatever, whoever comes in there to clean up the mess is going to do a referendum on cannabis and will be um, decriminalized at the minimum and probably be medical, you know, prescription for the nation. And then eventually we'll have recreational. And I think it will lead to uh, higher quality products, and it will um, lead to massive taxation, a lowering of crime, and most importantly, it's going to lower the abuse of truly dangerous drugs. And the truly dangerous drugs like opioids, my understanding of the early research, and again, it's early, is that when cannabis is recreationally available, in other words, you don't need a, a card or a license to get it, you can just buy it over the counter, opioid use and opioid deaths go down because it seems like the road to opioid addiction starts with, I had my wisdom teeth took, taken out. They gave me Oxycontin and Vicodin. I really loved it. My doctor gave me a little bit extra because I told them I was still in pain, even though I wasn't. And then I ran out and then my friend gave me some. Then I got some from a dealer. Then the dealer said, hey, do you want to try heroin? Because I'm out of oxys. I tried heroin. It was awesome. And then he said, if you love heroin, you're going to love fentanyl. And I did fentanyl and then I died. Like this is the path that people are on. Now, that path can end at, I got wisdom teeth taken out and I took CBD because my doctor said this is an alternative to uh, taking these opioids that have a high addiction and it's cheaper and it's available. Or I took the opioids, I felt like I was kind of getting addicted to it and I liked the feeling of not having pain in my knees because I used to play basketball, whatever, too much. And I started taking CBD or tinctures that reduced my pain. And I think that's going to be the big win for society. I am not saying I think kids should take drugs. I'm not saying people should abuse them. But I do think realistically, we have people abusing many things in society, whether they're speeding or standing on top of their motorcycles or taking legal prescription pills or illegally acquired prescription pills, just killing themselves with alcohol. There's a million different ways to kill yourself. Cannabis is way far down on the list, way far down on the list. And to make it illegal makes no sense. Um, we're going to just get we're already seeing the gains of making it not illegal here in California. And so my hope is the rest of the country can benefit from this. And certainly for pain, these, this is a no brainer. I mean, opioids are literally killing hundreds of people a week. Like people are dying out there and cannabis has killed nobody. Okay. Great question. Okay, hey, uh, let me take a moment to thank Athletic Greens. I have found something that has put me at the top of my game. If you've been following my Insta, you know I'm out there on the tennis court, uh, volleying and serving and, and just getting out there and trying to be less fat. I am loving playing tennis, and I have been taking Athletic Greens. They are delicious, and my wife likes the fact that I'm getting healthy and not drinking 18 Diet Cokes a day anymore. I am drinking my Athletic Greens. She makes me a beautiful smoothie in the morning. The whole family makes them, and we all drink uh, this Athletic Greens, and uh, they spent 10 years creating this. It's efficient, complete, convenient nutritional insurance for you. 75 ingredients covering 11 areas of your health and ensures you give your body what it needs through the day so you can power through and get everything done as an entrepreneur or a journalist or whatever you're doing if you're listening to this student. It re replaces a fistful of supplements, and I don't like taking all those pills, uh, and it adds critical nutrient support. Again, we love it. We drink it. And actually, people here at the office have been drinking it. So here is a special deal for our This Week in Startups listeners, 20 free travel packs, because you know when you're traveling, God, 
That's when it goes right out the window, the diet. 20 free travel packs valued at $99 with your first purchase. Getting into a daily routine with Athletic Greens really will be the single best thing you do for your health and success this year. I can say that. So go to athleticgreens.com slash twist, athleticgreens.com slash twist, and claim your special offer today. That's athleticgreens.com slash twist. Don't miss out and get that free 20-day or 20 travel packs for free, valued at $99. Thanks again, and welcome to the program, new uh, partner, Athletic Greens. So nice to have you here with us. Okay, Verdi has a great question. What's the right balance between holding ownership and selling shares into a secondary transaction to keep founders and employees focused on their main objective, which of course is building a business, building a large company, but relieve some of the stress and pressure of having been building a company for several years. When is it appropriate, if at all? Okay, secondary shares. What that means is the company allows the founders and maybe even employees, early shareholders, to liquidate some of their shares before the company gets acquired or goes public. So in the case of Uber, you may have read that Masayoshi-san from SoftBank put out a tender offer, which means an offer for a certain price to buy shares from Uber shareholders. Some of those Uber shareholders sold him some of their shares at a $50 billion valuation. And for people who were early investors like myself, I wouldn't say if I did or didn't sell, but I've always told people that if you got in early and you can sell at a very high valuation, you might want to sell a little bit. That's not a bad idea. Now, for the founders, if you are the board of directors and you are making this decision with them, one of the things you have to be careful about, and this is a little bit technical, is that when you allow people to sell secondary shares, you have priced the common shares. There are two types of shares in a company, typically here in Silicon Valley, preferred, Those are the ones that go first, and those are the valuable ones that are owned by the venture capitalists and common. Common are owned by the founders and the employees. The difference is the people who buy the preferred shares, they get their money out first because they put money into the company. It's just a tradition here in Silicon Valley to pay those shareholders off for their um, investment. Now, the common shares typically have a valuation that is a little bit lower than the preferred shares. They're at a discount, and we do something called a 409A valuation What that means is somebody values the stock, which is illiquid. So once people start buying and selling the stock, it's no longer illiquid. Therefore, the price that other employees who've come into your company pay for it has to be marked higher. So the early employee selling then puts a burden on the later employees who have to have a higher strike price typically. That's one mechanical issue. But the bigger issue you're asking about is, Does it distract the founder? Well, if the founder raises, I've always told people, above 10 or $20 million, that money can become a burden to them because you have to then do something with it. You have to manage it. You have to look at it in your bank account every day and say, should I be doing something else with it? Should I buy a home? Should I go on vacation? What am I doing here every day? If I have enough money to be on a beach, should I just surf every day? Now, they don't always act on those, but... If they were to sell 50 million, 100 million early on, then it becomes a huge distraction because they might buy three or four homes and buy a plane. And now they've created this incredible lifestyle that sucks their attention. And they're not as hungry and they're not as focused. So there is a balance there. Most people think, you know, founders have been at it for four, five, six, seven years. No harm in letting them buy a home. Three, four, five million dollars is what a great home here in Silicon Valley costs, or maybe an average one. Uh, keeps going up. So if somebody could sell a million or $2 million in shares in an average city and have their retirement savings, uh, a little bit in their retirement savings, maybe buy a condo, that seems probably right. So that's generally how people think about it. And the other issue, is it fair for everybody? And do you know who's buying the shares? So you want to have some controls in place. A great attorney will work on you with that. So you don't want to people to sell their shares off the books and you don't know about it as a CEO. So all secondary shares should be approved and you should have Rofer as the founder. Rofer. Rofer means right of first refusal. I'm not barking. Rofer. You want that Rofer. Right of first refusal. That means the company can buy the shares back, maybe retire them, which means there's less shares in the company, which everybody's shares go up in value theoretically. Or You could pick who buys them. Maybe the founder gets to buy them back. Maybe the investors get to buy them back. Maybe your co-founder gets first option. So as a founder, you want to think about that as well. Good question, Verdi. 
Okay, Jillian has a great question. What is the current investment environment for an early stage company that has been accepted into an incubator with an angel investor on board, or maybe a couple of angel investors, but, and here's the but, the product has only been in production for a couple of days, has some good initial engagement, but the statistics on the data is largely irrelevant. So we would call this um, a product that's launched, but has no traction, okay? No real significant uh, traction. So I would say the investment environment would be lukewarm or warm if the product was exceptional. In other words, you could look at the product and say, you know what, this really does solve a problem and it's, it's got good craftsmanship to it. The, the logo is beautiful, the UX is beautiful and I talked to those 10 customers who are using it and they say they can't live without it. Now, if this is a consumer product and only 10 people have used it and they're your friends and they say it's amazing and you gave them a survey, do you think my product's good or amazing? Well, we could discount that. But if you had 10 people using it and they were all the CFOs of a company, of publicly traded companies, and they said, wow, this is life-changing, this finance software, well, that's different because they might spend you know, $10,000 a month on your product or services. So the, the initial engagement is critically important. And so great investors will actually unpack that. And most of them, if the product is launched, will say, you know what, I'll wait. Sometimes you'll come out of a great incubator or accelerator, like the launch incubator, Y Combinator, Techstars, and the reputation of the incubator will create a halo. Maybe the angel investors, Chris Socker or myself or Cyan Bannister uh, or Ed Roman or Zach or whoever it happens to be, Matt, these are all great angel investors here in Silicon Valley. People will say, oh, I know that investor, Ed Roman. I know Cyan Bannister. I know this investor. They do a great do job. Dave Samuels from Freestyle. I'm going to, oh, the homebrew team. Oh, Aileen from Cowboy Ventures. And they'll say, you know what? That's the social proof. Now for me, I like to make my own decisions. I'll take a meeting of somebody I know who's reputable, invested in the company, but I like to make my own decision, honestly. That's not how most investors think. They, they do look for that social uh, proof, as we call it here in Silicon Valley. So the incubator could be a positive signal. It could be even negative signal. There are incubators that most people say, oh, that incubator isn't very good. The founder of that incubator is not notable. And... They haven't produced any great companies and that person hasn't invested in anything meaningful. So therefore it could work against you. So um, I would say your investment will depend largely on who, which incubator, which angel that could be critical because of social proof and the initial engagement, it'll depend on what those customers will eventually be worth. So if it's Instagram and you have 10 people and they're posting 10 photos a day, Hmm those people might ultimately be worth, I don't know, $50 a year here in America if you had massive advertising or $10 a year, who knows. But if they were enterprise com customers using Slack and those 10 people were paying $8 a month, maybe you could make a better inference. Or if it was superhuman and they're paying $25 a month for email, you say, wow, they're paying $25 a month, they're using it all day, they love it. Maybe there's something here, I'll dig a little deeper. It will get you the meeting, it might not close a deal. Great question, Jillian. Okay, here's a question from Chrissy. I know as founders that we are always supposed to be raising money, but why? If you have the ability to bootstrap a consumer app to the point where you reach product market fit and generate a five-figure, six-figure, even seven-figure monthly reoccurring revenue, what is the purpose of raising money from angels and VCs? Advice to plan an exit? Shouldn't the goal for most founders be to make money instead of raise money? Fantastic question, Chrissy. The goal of a founder is not to be always raising money. Raising money is because most people do not have the ability to build a team that can build a product off of bootstrapping. But as I say in my book, Angel, uh, which is available where all fine books are available, bootstrapped founders are my favorite type of people. I like people who are hustlers and maybe got two or three people on your team. One's a designer, one's a product person, one's a developer, and you can just grind and make that product better and better month after month. And you're burning zero dollars and you have a consulting gig on the side that pays your rent. Or you guys, you guys all save money from your last gig at Google or Uber, or you cashed in some Uber shares and now you're off to the races and you're going to spend six months a year building this. Who knows? 
But that is a great situation. And if you can then start monetization without having raised money, when you do go to raise money, oh my God, are you going to be in a pole position to get a great valuation from a great investor? There is nothing as desirable as a founder who has bootstrapped their way to profitability and some sort of critical mass. The reason it doesn't happen that often, well, if funding is available and you're a great founder, well, why not take it? Why not take 10%, 20% dilution to be able to go faster or to be able to hire better people or more people and to have a better product? So if you're, if you're bootstrapped and you're only three people and your competitor raises $3 million and hires a team of 10, they, and they have the ability to do marketing and they can outbid you on Google AdSense and they can have a sales executive coming in and selling your product, well, maybe they can beat you in the market even though they have... You know, even though you bootstrapped it and you have 100% of the cap table, the person who diluted 30% for $3 million, they might actually beat you in the market. So that's why you're not doing your startup in a vacuum. You need to actually consider taking money. A lot of times when people raise money, it's to defend themselves against potential competitors in the future. And people will raise money just to screw with other investors. Like they'll really push hard. Like I'm going to raise an obscene amount of money. We saw this with you know, Airbnb and Uber and Dropbox, when they raise those monster rounds and they've got this huge pile of cash sitting there, a competitor is going to have a hard time because they could lower their prices and increase their uh, reach of the product, do more marketing and really compete heavily. So it's great to be a bootstrap founder, but you do need to think about when funding makes sense for you. Um, if you can build the business to $20, $30 million and sell it and you own 100% of it, mazel tov, it's great. But that's not typically what happens, and you're not operating in a vacuum. So keep that in mind. If it's competitive and you're going to be up against people, you may want to accept that 20%, 30%, 15% dilution to have that extra gunpowder, to have that dry powder that you can use to fend off the eventual copycats and competitors. Great question, Chrissy. Here's a great question from James who asks, what is a great strategy for increasing your expertise in your field, either through supplemental products blogs, video tutorials, etc. Obviously, there are tons of videos on YouTube and other places where you can just level up, and that's fantastic. One thing people don't know about is there are often message boards and IRC or Slack chat rooms where people have gathered to discuss things like growth marketing or design and meetup.com groups. So I think meeting people who are in the field and talking to them, having dinner with them, lunch, that type of stuff is really powerful because that networking, which can be hard to do, it can be arduous. Sometimes you go to events, it's a total dud. Other times it's crowded, insane. I think don't put aside the networking and face-to-face. -face. And also the uh, chat rooms are something that people don't generally know about. IRC chat rooms where experts hang out. Core is another great place, obviously, where you see experts answering questions in order to grow their networks. LinkedIn groups, also amazing. Facebook groups, okay, but not as targeted as LinkedIn groups for business. But you might stumble upon a good Facebook group, but the LinkedIn groups are also very powerful. And you'd be amazed just posting to them um, how much feedback you can get. I've seen some good Reddit, actually, groups. So if you go on a Reddit group and you're trying to learn about cryptocurrency, you might actually find something interesting. So <clears throat> community sites, chat rooms, IRC, uh, and in person are the things you didn't list that I think could be um, super, super awesome at supplementing uh, your skills. And adding new skills for the sake of adding new skills is always good because of just keeping your mind sharp. So I started playing this uh, year backgammon, tennis, and I uh, got my guitar out of storage and I'm actually restringing it this week and this weekend hopefully I'm going to play a little bit. So I'm trying to just get myself... Um, keep myself sharp, right? So I took up poker a decade ago, got very good at that. I'd like to do that for backgammon, maybe do it for guitar and, you know, tennis so that my mind stays sharp and I get that, you know, sharpness and crispness. So it doesn't need to be just going deeper into your own discipline. Read some books, get out of your own discipline. Look at the adjacencies or things that are far off. Maybe learning how to be a poet or a writer or a separate, another language, can help you get your, you know, mind going and your juices flowing because cross-disciplinary skills are fantastic. So if you're a designer and you learned about topography or you're a designer and you learn about, 
um, developing and programming, or you learn about project management, this could really help where you learn about sales even and how the sales team is selling what it is you're designing where you're a salesperson, you take a design course. I like cross-disciplinary people. They seem to be very good and bold uh, at changing the course of a company. So if you can write and design where you're great at photography and you're great at music, and then you can put something together that maybe in a movie or a documentary that somebody who didn't study photography or topography couldn't, this cross-disciplinary stuff to me uh, as I get older, I think is more and more valuable. People who have seen it all and done a lot of different things, when they come to the table, they can plow through problems faster. And they also, you start to get a boldness. Hey, I learned how to play tennis. I learned how to play backgammon. I learned how to play poker. I became very good at those. The next thing I'll figure out. And literally I was, you know, handing off, I have a lot of like assistants and people to support me. And I can afford to hire somebody to come to the house now and fix something. And then I was like, wait a second. I wonder if there's a YouTube video for this. So like, as an, it's a stupid example, but my stupid hot water heater was broken. And I went online. I found it. I found the part. I took the thing apart. I literally took the hot water heater for the pool apart, reset it, got it working again. And then it's shorted again and it's not working. I was, oh, you know what? I found on a message board that this model of board shorts because it wasn't covered and rain got into it and the keypad got stuck. This is a really all stupid, a stupid example. But a lot of the answers are out there because people ask them on message boards, they get SEO'd, then some expert who's selling pool services then does a video about it. And it's all online. So take whatever thing you're suffering through and you're trying to figure out and try to be a little handy at solving that. I have trained my team here at Launch and This Week in Startups and my companies that when I ask them to do something or they face some problem, to do a Google search, do a YouTube search, and go find everything you can about the answer and see if you can solve it yourself before you engage an expert. Because even if you can't solve it yourself, in the case of the heater, I couldn't solve it myself, but I knew what needed to happen. So when we called the hot water uh, repair person, we told them, we have this heater, we need this part. And this part costs this much, and we see it online here. So we knew the cost of the part, and the person couldn't rip us off. This is what happens when you get good at stuff. And I did the same thing selling a home recently, where I bought it off market, and I worked with an attorney to do the sale, not a broker. And I saved a large amount of money by learning that. So I'm really getting into this concept of being radically independent and resourceful. This is what founders do. And I forgot for a while that I could do this in all aspects of my life. Because you get a little complacent sometimes. You're like, oh, somebody will fix this. Don't wait for somebody to fix it. Go and fix it yourself. If the camera in your studio, your microphone stops working, well, just flip it over, look at the model number and solve it. Well, that's what you should be doing in your life. That's what you should be doing with everything you face. If you don't understand your retirement and your 401k and how it works, well, then just watch a couple of goddamn videos online and take control of your damn retirement. Literally, I have people who are like, yeah, how does retirement work? I'm like, have you been on YouTube? Go on Wealthfront. They have a blog. They explain all this. They have everything that needs to be known is on YouTube and Google and Quora and the experts are on all these weird forums. It's all out there. So I got my guitar. I watched a video on how to do the strings. There's this new device where you wind your strings. That didn't exist when I was playing guitar 20 years ago. And I found all these videos on how to play Dire Straits songs, which I probably will never be able to do, but I'm going to sit there like a dork and I'm going to try to play Sultans of Swings and Private Investigations and Telegraph Road. And I'm, for me, it's going to be joyful. And when I played my dad in backgammon this summer, I had watched like five videos and I beat him. My dad's an incredible backgammon player who's shocked because I watched a video and one video changed my life. I watched a video series where this person did every opening move. So you have two dice in backgammon, six sides to each dice. There's a finite number of opening moves. They literally tell you which opening moves and why. Once you watch that video, you go from a beginner backgammon player immediately to intermediate if you understand the, the math and the theories, which I did immediately. It wasn't that difficult. So you can make great gains. Uh, and I really appreciate you bringing this up because young people are trained to be absolutely uh, ineffective and paralyzed 
at solving problems. I've never done that before. I don't know how to do that. How do I do that? How do you do it? YouTube.com, Quora.com. Search, type guitar forums, Mark Knopfler, Guitar Technique, Telegraph Road. That's it. You'll find it. It's out there. All the answers are out there. Jeez, I'm getting all worked up. Okay, listen. This has been another amazing episode of Ask Jason. I really enjoy doing this. And for next month, we do it every month, we're going to do a live call-in show. Maybe we'll even allow people to come live to the studio. You never know. Oh, everybody's a little nervous about that one. Ooh, get some crazies in here. You never know. Uh, we got some super fans. They get a little enthusiastic. So if you would like to um, ask me a question, you know how to get me. Jason at Calacanis.com. And if you ask me a great question, I forward it on to the team and we'll have you call in to the show. So just put Ask Jason in the subject line. Okay, we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.